So, what is up, y'all? I wanted to record a quick crash course on resin and how to use it. Um, that will work if you're brand new to resin or if you just need a like back to the basics type video, this is the video for you. So let's start out with what resin I'm using. This is Stone Coat Art Coat Resin. This is a one-to-one -one resin that has a very long working time. It has UV resistance that's like some of the best on the market. It has no odor. It has a good viscosity, which means it moves very well on the canvas and it levels out at an eighth inch thick. Sorry, that is Bowie. Um, and it's just great. It has a high heat resistance up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's awesome if you're going to also be making coasters or trivets or like uh, hot pan holders. Um, it comes in two parts, so if you get a one gallon kit, which this would be, you get half gallon of part B and half gallon of part A. So when you go to mix it, it's a one to one ratio, which means however much of this one you use, you use the same amount of this one. And the cup I'm using today is a graduated cup, which gives me these little notches on the side so I can see how much I poured in of one and I can just match that at the other one. So for the two canvases I'm gonna work on today, I'm gonna to make 10 ounces, which probably is gonna be a little bit too much, but it's better to have too much than not enough. I always pour in the part B first, which is the hardener, and that's because it's a thinner consistency. And when you mix the two parts together, it will be less likely to stick to these sides if you put the thinner one in first. So put the thin one in and then put the thicker one, which would be the part A, which is the resin. It's very important to make sure you have a very accurate measurement because if you have too much hardener and not enough resin, it may not ever set up or it may be really soft after it sets. And if you have too much resin and not enough hardener, then it may set up too quickly. So you need something to stir it with. I'm using our ATD stir sticks. They're clear, they're reusable. After you use it, just wipe it off with like an alcohol rag and it's good to go for the next time you use it. So you can see it's got all these swirls in there because I haven't mixed it up at all yet. You're gonna mix it for about three minutes or um, a minute past when you stir it up and it goes clear. Let me change the angle of this camera so you can see more of what I'm doing. See how it's got like almost a pearl oops, look to it and it's not exactly clear. Once you mix it all the way up, it'll be really crystal clear no matter what brand of resin you're using. Most resins have about a 45 minute working time. This resin, I usually can work it about two hours if I need to, but that's under ideal conditions. And for resin, the ideal conditions are a dry 73 to 75 um, Fahrenheit. When you mix your resin up, you're gonna see some bubbles start to mix in as well. That's just gonna happen when you mix your part A and part B together. It's nothing to get worked up about. It's something that we're gonna address later. You can see that it's getting clearer, but there's little bubbles in there. When you're mixing it up, you have to make sure that you scrape the sides and the bottom of your cup, as well as the stir stick you're using, because if you don't fully incorporate everything in your cup, then you may end up with weak spots in your resin painting. So it may set up perfectly, except for like a little spot will be a little bit soft. And if it's soft after a few days and it's just never gonna set and you have to like dremel it out, clean it and do a flood coat, it's a pain. So better safe than sorry and 
makes it for the recommended amount of time for whatever resin you're using. There's usually instructions on the back that tell you best uses. But most of them say mix for about three minutes. Some of them are measured by weight instead of volume. So you have to have a scale for those. But most of the resins you can just do visually, make sure it's equal parts instead of weighing it. Now, some people mix in large quantities and they'll use uh, like a power tool, which is also okay. You'll mix more bubbles into the resin that way, but you'll get it mixed up more quickly. Um, and we're going to add heat later on to pop the little bubbles. But that is nothing we need to worry about just yet. Also, there are resins that are two to one, four to one, eight to one. Those are usually for floors or casting. That's a whole nother ball of wax. If you're doing just artwork, make sure you're getting a resin that is for artwork so that it'll set up better and it will, usually the art resins have a better UV resistance, which is really important, especially if you use any kind of white. If you use a resin that doesn't have a very good UV resistance, then it'll yellow over time because ultimately what a resin is, is a plastic. So after you're sure you have everything mixed up really well, it's time to start mixing your colors. Fun fact, sometimes you'll read on um, resin that you should mix it in one bucket, pour it into another one, mix it, and then pour it back into the first one. That's just to make sure you get everything scraped off the sides. But if you just make sure you scrape the sides every few seconds while you're mixing it, you'll have a full incorporation and you don't have to waste another bucket. After you're done using this, you can take an alcohol rag, wipe the inside out and reuse these as well as your stir sticks. So you can see it has no more swirls in it. It's not cloudy anymore, but there are a lot of bubbles. Again, don't stress about the bubbles just yet. So today I'm going to be pouring on canvases for you guys. These are just um, gallery wrapped canvases from Blick. I prep them and tighten them with a process that I have in another video. But if you're pouring on wood, you need to make sure that it is sealed in or else you'll get very persistent bubbles coming through the wood because wood is porous and it'll try to, the resin is self-leveling, so it'll try to seep through wherever it can. So a lot of air will come up through it. So what we like to do is seal it with polycrylic or you can use Mod Podge or probably even like Elmer's glue. Don't forget to get the sides and the back, get all of it so you're sure everything is well sealed in. So now that we have our boards, um, the colors that I'm gonna use today are from a couple different brands. I'm gonna be using China Blue from Color Obsession, this is a paste. I'm gonna use Just Resin Titanium White, it's also a paste. I'm gonna use Color Obsession Dark Turquoise it's a paste. I'll probably also use Color Obsessions 008 Pale Gold. This is a metal flake powder. And I'll be using my Stone Coat base tint. This is not the container it comes in. I put it in here because it is a large container. It's easier for me to handle this bottle than the original, and I can just squirt a little bit in at a time. So um, the types of paint that you can use in resin are almost anything. I would recommend a, not really using a lot of oil paints because oil-based paints don't really ever dry. 
and it may give you pitting or fish eyes or it may just disrupt how um, the resin sets so it could give you issues in the long run with using oil paints also it is recommended not to use anything with that's water-based because resin and water don't really mix well so it can degrade the durability and um, hardness of the resin. So if you're using it for like a countertop, you may not end up with a, a countertop that is 100% um, rugged or uh, chemical resistant or water resistant or resistant to the 500 degrees Fahrenheit that this resin boasts because the water can break down the chemical components in the resin. So um, just keep that in mind. You can also use water-based um, paints. Just make sure you do a clear coat of just the resin over the finished piece, like the next day after it's set up. But I can go over that more later as well. So. Once you have your colors picked out, you're going to have to have some other cups to mix the individual colors. Since I'm doing about four colors, there are my four cups. I may do more colors. Who knows? It is my belief for my artwork that you really want to keep the colors very simple and very minimal because for every color you use, once those colors interact with each other, they're going to make at least one more color and you don't want to overwhelm your palette and make things too busy. So four colors or less is all you need for a very elegant painting. I also like to do a lot of negative space, but I'll go over that sort of thing later. So we have our resin and at this point you need to decide how much of each color you want represented in your painting. Since I'm going to be doing negative space, I'm not going to need that much of any one color. So if this is going to be my China blue, I'm going to make probably four ounces of it. So nope, not four ounces. Um, an ounce and a half. This is a three ounce Dixie cup. So it's half full with resin. The next color I have is white and I don't really use that much white either but for the purposes of demo I'm going to make a little bit extra. Next color is dark turquoise. I'm going to fill it halfway up for this one as well. And then I have the gold. The thing about using metallics like these in resin is that they tend to take over so I, I usually only use those as an accent color. So I'm filling this a third of the way up at most because I'm not going to use that much of the color in the piece. So I don't need to make that much of it in the resin. Conserve when you can. So this is what a paste looks like from Color Obsession. It is just like a very thick, nope, you're not in that camera, you're over here. It is a very thick consistency paint. It kind of looks like an acrylic paint, slightly thinner. These are epoxy pastes. They are made to use in resin specifically. And the importance of that is when it's made for resin, it mixes in and um, can't even think of the word right now, but it just easily mixes into the resin without giving you like freckles of solid color. It just kind of melts into the resin. It's very smooth and it just makes it easier. If you use things like acrylic paints and resin, not only is acrylic paint um, water-based, but Sometimes you can get dried acrylic paint in the bottles and those dry chunks of acrylic definitely won't mix into the resin. So you'll have to pick out chunks of 
paint flakes while you're doing your painting, it, as opposed to just it mixing smoothly into the resin. So that was the China Blue. If you do use acrylics, just make sure you like sieve it, sift it, run it through a strainer. Yeah, run it through a strainer first. This next color is just resin white. And in resin world, what white you use is very important because different pastes will give you um, different types of cells. Cells are very desirable in resin artwork. And a lot of times that comes down to what white you're using. This particular white will give you frothy cells and like lacing. And the white base tint that I showed you guys in the squeeze bottle gives more like webbing. But I'll, I'll demo the difference in just a minute. The next color is my all-time favorite. It is dark turquoise. It looks black, but it is just a super deep, rich turquoise. So the amount of paint you want to mix into your resin is about 10% paint to resin ratio. Basically, if you stir your paint in your jar that it comes in, usually if you're working in Dixie Cups, the amount that's still on your stir stick when you pull it out is about the amount that you want to use in there anyways. You can always add more paint. It's impossible to take it out. So just build your color. That's easy to do if you're using a resin that has a long working time or open time. Many craft resins that you can get at hobby stores only give you about 45 minutes to work with it. So you have to move really quickly. But this has two hour working time so I can chat about it and take my time, not rush through it. It's a luxury. So. That paint is already mixed in and is well incorporated into my resin already. Most of the pastes are going to be opaque as well as the powders. I do have some tints that are transparent. Color Obsession makes some really lovely, very pigmented tints. beautiful white. It's almost too white. You can't even really see it in the camera. This next color is the dark turquoise. Just like when you're mixing your part A and part B of resin together and you scrape the sides and the stir stick, also make sure you do that when you mix your colors so that everything is very well incorporated. That's the word I was trying to think of earlier. All right, for powders, we also recommend to put resin in your cup, then add the color and then top it off with more resin so that when you try to mix it together, it doesn't plume up in your face. Also, I use more than 10% with my powders. I kind of overload it because I feel like it sticks together better when you have more of the powder. That may be just my assumption, but it seems to work that way for me. Also, when you start to heat up the resin and manipulate your colors around, it can, your powders can get kind of diluted because when you heat your resin, it thins it out. And then when resin's more thin, it's more inclined to mix with the other colors you have down. So just keep that in mind. All right, so that's our color palette for right now. I'm gonna move these down here. And I'm gonna switch one of my gloves. And the reason for that is 
because I want to put some clear resin down on my canvases. And since it's negative space, if I have any paint on my hands, which I almost always do from mixing my colors, um, I'll end up streaking my perfectly white background and kind of ruin my elegant look that I'm going for. So always be mindful of what colors are on your hands. All right, I always lay down at least a thin layer of clear before I add my artwork. Particularly important when you do negative space. I always put some clear down first and that is because a resin will move more easily across a surface that already has resin on it. If you ever have done watercolors or alcohol inks, it's the same premise that it just is not going to flow very easily when there isn't anything down first. So I always put some clear down just so that my stained resin will move more easily over the surface. Also, since I'm doing a negative space, this is going to lift my colors off of the background and give an extra layer of dimension, which is also something that's really desired in resin artwork. A lot of people sometimes will um, use like a spatula to move their resin around. I like to use my fingers. It lets me see um, if there's any impurities in the canvas and how thick the resin is in different areas of the canvas. That being said though, it's gonna self-level anyways. It'll self-level to an eighth inch now I have a nice even layer of resin across the whole surface. You'll notice that there are bubbles in the surface. Not an issue. We're going to use a heat gun to pop those bubbles. Um, you can use any heat gun really. I wouldn't recommend a blow dryer just because that's going to push more air than you really need. You don't want to blow all of your resin off of the surface. You also don't want to thin it out too much. You can also use a torch. Oftentimes I'll use a torch instead. Make sure if you're using a torch, there's no alcohol laying around that may catch on fire because that is very, um, it's very bad. So now there are no bubbles left in the surface. You can't really tell, but that's kind of the point. It's a very smooth, very even surface we've got with no bubbles. So now it's time to add our paints. And for negative space, You really want to be mindful of how much resin you put down because you're going to be moving and manipulating your paint and you don't want it to just take over. That'll eat up all the negative space that you wanted to keep white on this one. So I'm just going to run it through both of these. And I'm going to start pouring off of the canvas because if you start pouring on the canvas, it'll leave kind of a blob. And if you start pouring off the canvas, then you'll have an even stream all the way across it. It's very important to know where you're going before you start pouring because if you hesitate, you'll get these little squiggles and you want it to be an even flow. So start pouring off and come all the way across. That's almost a blob. See how it's a little bit too thick right here as opposed to the consistency of it, the rest of the length. Just keep that in mind. 
so next I'm going to mix up some just resin white with my white base tint from Stone Coat. And the reason why I'm mixing the two is because the shade of white I prefer in the just resin. This one's a little bit gray. Like it's a gray white as opposed to like a stark white. I don't know, it's maybe hard to tell on this camera, but it, this is definitely not as pure white as this one, which is fine because you can mix epoxy paints with other epoxy paints, even if it's not the same brand, which is awesome. I mix colors all the time for custom shades of any color. So I'm going to show you the difference in whites. These are only two of the whites that are out there on the market, but these are two of my favorites. I'm also a fan of Color Obsessions Snow White. It's very similar to the Titanium White. So now I'm going to add some of the white from Stone Coat and Just Resin mixed together. I'm just going to add it right through there. And I'm going through some of the colors so that I can get a cell structure on the inside of my color wave as opposed to just on the outer edges. You can pour your colors right next to each other or overlapping. It all is what you feel like doing. There's really not a wrong way to do this. It's all what you feel like doing once you've learned the basics. And the basics ultimately are how to mix your resin, what can be mixed into resin, and some simple techniques, which I'm gonna go over for you guys as well. I'm also gonna put some of the white on the outside this is the white that has the stone coat mixed into it. And I'm going to put a vein of the gold through here. This is going to be a finer line than the other ones because it'll take over your piece if you're not careful. I'm also going to add a little bit more of the turquoise. So it's my opinion that the thinner you pour the lines of color, the busier it's going to look in the end. So you really want to commit to a few thick lines as opposed to a lot of thin lines. So now I'm going to add some heat. You can do this with a torch or a heat gun. This is just a like creme brulee torch. All I'm doing at this point is popping some bubbles and thinning out the resin just a little bit. Now, you don't wanna thin your resin out too much for a few reasons. If you thin it out too much, it will run off of your surface. This resin and a lot of resins will try to hold on the surface at an eighth inch, but the thinner it gets, the less it can hold on to itself, the viscosity changes, and it'll just keep rolling off. Also important to make sure wherever you're painting at or wherever you're going to set it up to completely set like overnight has to be perfectly level because if you're even a little bit low, that's where all your resin is going to go. Think about it as if you had water somewhere like on a table and it was just a little bit down on any edge. That's where the water is going to run. So if you like what your shape is, make sure everything's super level or else everything's going to run off. And that is incredibly frustrating. So now that you have your paint down, you can manipulate it in a number of ways. This first technique is called a swipe. 
I just use um, kind of like a freezer paper or a wax paper. And you want to make sure that you don't have any downturned corners. These are all turned up. If they're turned down, they're just going to scrape through your resin and mess up the flow of what you're going to do. So you want to lay it down flat, not vertical, because if you do this, you're just going to scrape your resin. So you want to lay it flat and get about a pencil width. You'll be able to see it, a pencil width um, in contact with your paper. It's important to move slow. If you move too fast, your swiping paper is just going to skip across the surface. You want to move slow enough for your paper to pick up and redeposit down the paint as you pull it across the surface. Whatever color you start, like you lay your paper on, is what's going to be on top. So now I have about a pencil width picked up. You can see the dark right there. And I'm just going to take my time and pull it across the surface. of my canvases. Just like that. See that fun little gradation across the surface? Now, once I hit heat on that, it's going to sell up. And that is what I was talking about before, something that's really desired in resin work. You can see those little holes, these little differences in color. And these little cells are going to grow as the resin settles and um, relaxes on the surface of the canvas. And now you can see even from that little amount of time these cells really starting to come up in the piece. Now that's something that people really like to see in this type of artwork. So that's one way of doing it. Now for this other type of white that I was telling you about, I'm going to put just a little bit right here. And this is going to give me, these are large cells, and this is going to give me more like a frothy type of cell. And this is what I would use for, like if I was going to do an ocean pour, something like that. Dang it. So, for frothy cells, I recommend using a torch because you want to heat the top layer of resin at a different rate than the bottom layer, and this is going to hit the top layer way harder and faster than what a heat gun is going to do. So what I'm going to do is heat it and tilt it, and that's going to give me some frothy wave-like cells. You have to be really careful when using a torch for your cells because if you scorch your resin, it will discolor it, it'll turn yellow, and it basically almost instant sets your resin, and 
it'll be like a scab where everything else will be fully leveled and complete. Your little scab area will be not on the same level as everything else on your piece. So these little cells are the difference as opposed to these larger dynamic cells. There was some stone coat base tint on this area as well, so that's going to it's going to have a little bit of that over there as well. So, let's go on with our piece. You can also use just a heat gun to blow the color as well. There are different kinds of little attachments that you can use. I prefer the swipe technique right now because it prevents you from using too much heat with a heat gun or a torch. The thing with using too much heat is, other than it thinning out your resin and it could just all blob off, is that for cell structure, you don't want to overheat it because if the resin's too thin, it doesn't have anything to keep it, the cells together. So just keep that in mind. So where do we want to take this piece next? Let's do a couple more swipes. Mm -mm. I always say to pull your swipes towards you if, like, say I wanted to swipe through this way. The best thing to do is turn the piece around towards you so that you can pull towards yourself. However, since it's the diptych, which means two paintings, that makes one piece of artwork. Um, because of that, I need it to be together. I'm just going to do it this way. That's not how you should do it at home, folks. So, also a tip for swiping is you want to have everything running in a consistent motion. So I would never pull one this way since everything is flowing this way. It would disrupt the flow of the piece. So I want to pull this way. I feel like there's something missing right here, so I'm going to add more paint and then do another pull through this way. I always, when I do a swipe, I always turn my swiping paper to an angle. Like if I'm pulling this way, I'll pick it up so that I'm trailing it off with this fine line. Because if you just pick your swiping paper up, it'll give a blunt stop, which is very distracting visually. Now let's see what cells we have in these little groups of wipes we just did. I feel like there's a void down here so I'm going to probably continue the swipe up this way and then bring some down through here as well. Let's just get another piece of paper. So the composition that you choose to do, um, it's very much just up to you.
There are so many different ways to apply resin to things. You can do puddle pours. You can do swipes. You can do balloon smashes. You can do squishes. You could do flip cups. You do flip and drag. There are so many different ways to apply resin. Literally endless. And there's, I'm sure, a million different things that have still yet to be discovered. So don't ever get discouraged when you're doing resin. There's always something new to discover or to learn. One of the hardest things to do in resin is knowing when to quit. Knowing when it's good and you should just not do any more to it. I have a really hard time with knowing when to stop. So I'm probably going to stop before too long on this one so I don't overwork the resin and ruin the piece that I'm already really liking. The only thing I feel like I need to adjust is these rounded points as opposed to these very thin trailed off points. It doesn't really look like it belongs in the piece. So I'm gonna try to make these look like they belong. I think that is just peachy. I also like to swipe with smaller pieces of paper because I feel like I have more control that way. I think I like it. So now I will put these in the dust free zone. Actually, I'm going to put a little bit more gold in here. Just a little. Because of surface tension, your boards or your canvases will literally only hold an eighth inch of resin unless you build the walls up on the sides, which you can do with tape. so that it kind of holds and creates a wall and a barrier so everything doesn't just blow off. So, um, the last thing you need to do is make sure you hit it with heat one more time to pop any bubbles. A lot of times we'll add heat 
after every color we put on the canvas so that we make sure that there are no air pockets left behind. If you let your resin set up with bubbles, you'll end up with a canvas that has a really horrible complexion and you'll have to sand it down um, and do a flood coat over it. There we go. So I'm gonna put these in the dust-free zone and I will come back to them in about 20 minutes, hit them with heat again because as the painting settles, bubbles are gonna be like compressed and kind of pushed up to the surface. It'll try to expel them, but sometimes it needs just a little bit of heat to help release all the bubbles that are in the resin. So keep that in mind as well. I'm just picking up some resin that has blown off the edge over here. Kind of fill that area in a little bit. And since I put more resin down, I need to hit it with a little bit of heat. Not too much because you're only trying to pop bubbles, not do anything else at this point. So I'm going to wipe the bottom of my board so I don't drip across the house. And we lay our boards on a plastic sheet. And it's important that it's plastic because resin doesn't stick to plastic. So the next day you can just pop these right off of the board without worry that it's going to like bond to your dust free zone. So it looks like I have some ah! resin left over. Nah, I'm not gonna do coasters. Bowie. So um, we're gonna let those set overnight and in the morning they'll be dry enough for me to pick up, look at, I wouldn't be able to set anything on them. Full cure is usually within 72 hours, but you really don't wanna, even though it's a painting, you're not gonna set anything on it anyways. But if it was like a coaster, for example, you don't wanna set anything on it for like 10 days. Even though you're not gonna mess it up, the weight of something on it would kind of give it a little texture. So. For paintings, just you don't want to ship them for the first 10 days if you sell it um, or want to send it to a relative or a friend or whatever. So I hope you enjoyed this quick little demo. I will be back in the morning to show you guys how those set up. So you guys, it is now the next day. These set up overnight and now they are all set and ready to go. Since it is a diptych, they would be displayed obviously like this. I just wanted to give you some close-ups of what we created. And at the end of this video, I will also do another little close-up with better lighting. The best way to photograph or video your artwork with resin is to um, go outside and find a, a place that has some indirect light and shoot it there during the daytime. You can see how that gold really floated in this area. One of my favorite things about that gold. Yeah. 
this side is definitely very clean and simple in comparison to the other side. But they set up perfectly smooth. Now, like I was saying in the first part of this video, these um, have only been setting up overnight, so I can touch them, I can manipulate them. I wouldn't stack them right now or package them up for shipping quite yet because they're still um, only one day set and you really need to wait till about 10 days till you put any weight on top of them. I wouldn't even, I probably wouldn't even like lean them up like this for another day just to make sure that it's completely set and it doesn't slump at all. I've never had that happen, but just to be sure. So to finish this off, we're going to, um, the way we usually do it is we sand down these little drips that have happened right here. A lot of times you can just pop them off, but this hasn't set up enough for me to be able to do that. Well, this one's coming off. You can just pop those little dots off of the back. See where it came from right here. And then we will spray paint it a solid color and probably the sides as well, unless otherwise requested by the buyer because it's a little bit sloppy. Sometimes people like to see the story of um, the movement of the paint and so they want to leave it other times not so if they request me to paint the sides then I will lay it upside down and spray paint the sides and the back and then I would sign it for this particular piece I would sign it right here but if um, it was just one painting since it is abstract and you could decide to hang it anyway at all. I would just rotate it around and find out which way I prefer it. And if it was one solo piece, I would probably still prefer it this way. Most of my pieces tend to go bottom left to upper right anyways. So I would sign it on the bottom right side edge of whatever whatever way that I would display it just in case I sold it to somebody and they would be like well I like it this way and if I had signed it right here then my signature would be upside down so that's why we sign on the bottom right side of the way that we would prefer to hang it that's an indicator for the purchaser of how you should display it but it's not like the final end-all be-all um, and the buyer has some kind of say as to how the piece is displayed. So, hope you enjoyed this tutorial and you enjoy your resin addiction. Now, you can get all the things that I used in this video on our website, www.artisttilldeath.com. Two T's, two L's. And if you have any questions at all, you can always reach out to us. This is how you can get a hold of us. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat. You can hit us up in email or you can send us some snail mail. If you have any questions, we are always down to help. Just hit us up however you, however you like. Or you can check us out on YouTube. Artist Till Death is our screen name. We would love to help you guys out. Let us know what you want to learn, and we will happily teach you. Till next time, we'll see y'all later. 